Hey, it's Dry Bear, and today I'd like to give my full review of Wild Hearts after having put over 85 hours into the game, completing all of the challenges, end game, and full campaign, and using all of the weapons in my experience. So if you're wondering if Wild Hearts is for you, hopefully this video will help you sort that out. So let's dive in. If you have any questions or comments for me, you'll find me live every day on twitch.tv forward slash Dry Bear. Hop by and say hi or come chat with me. If you found value in this video, leave a like down below. It helps me out tremendously. I can't even fully explain to you how much it helps. And of course, subscribe for more gaming content. Let's dive into the review. Now, the third, first thing I want to talk about is the weapons. I think in hunting genre games, the weapons are always the most important because they specify your play style and they are the thing you're going to be interacting with the most on these longer hunts, especially when you're doing harder and harder encounters. Uh, with various types of kimono. So I would say that in general, they had some amazing weapon designs when they were drafting Wild Hearts. We've seen many Monster Hunter-like or hunting genre games over the years that have uh, attempted to recreate some of the success that the Mon Monster Hunter IP has. And many of them have been successful. Uh, Dauntless has been really fun. There's tons of other games that are uh, really cool to check out. And I think this idea is neat. And one thing I appreciate with Wild Hearts is they were actually focused on creating some incredibly unique weapons in the in the game. They weren't any kind of major one-to-one -one comparisons. A lot of them had their own mechanics and their own ideas that went into it. A good mix of ranged and melee. Now there are only eight weapons in the game uh, as a launch, which I think I think is fair for a brand new IP. If it's a game that takes off or, you know, they end up doing a sequel or more DLC, they can add more. But I think it had a good setup. There were plenty that felt fresh and new. They had different mechanics and they also all interacted with the Karakuri system in unique ways, which made that part of the game feel even more fresh and invigorating because not only are you able to do the Karakuri and fusion Karakuri, you're able to use your weapon with it in unique ways as well. So I appreciated that. Quite a lot. I think in general they had some some awesome weapon choices. They had a weapon that changes into five different weapons and and rotates through that. Um, they had a parry focused weapon that was like building up meter. Um, they had a, a attack on Titan uh, weapon that was more about attaching to the monster and staying in the air. Uh, so it wasn't just your typical you know big sword, big hammer. Like they added their own flavor to it, which I think was really cool and pretty exciting to see in general. So let's talk about the Karakuri system. It's pretty extensive and it's something that it's kind of like the 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 flagship unique selling point for uh, Wild Hearts as a hunting game because, you know, it, 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 it's something that you don't really see too often. So it's a building system. You collect thread as a resource in the game and then you can use that thread to on the fly create deployables that you could use for various purposes. And you'll see them in the, the gameplay in the background here. By the way, this is a uh, end game challenge monster. It's actually the last challenge monster you can do. This is not related to the story at all. So if you're looking for story or whatever, this has nothing to do with the campaign. This is just one of the the, the hardest boss in the game. That's end game plus plus, uh, you know, unrelated to story, just a challenge monster. So uh, you can see as you're playing, you can create these. Now, it it actually had a really cool system for unlocking these and deploying them, but you could then hold this system, it's like a bring up in context display. You place out the Karakuri in front of you and you will place one that you had bound. You can only have four equipped and you'll place them out. There was a crate that you could build up um, which allowed you to jump on top of it and create a plunge attack. There was a spring that you could use to jump forward and create distance. And then there's some like functional ones like the glider where you can go up in the air and use aerial attacks or get around the monster. It had a lot of opportunities for creating aerials. And I think, again, this made the weapons more interesting because anytime you had a, a specific weapon that had a play style, the Karakuri would change that up, right? Say you had a slow weapon, you're using a big heavy weapon like the Maul or the Nodachi. Uh, you could use the Karakuri to create openings that otherwise a slow weapon wouldn't have, like being able to jump up in the air and plunge or being able to rotate around very quickly and hit a weak spot or use the glider to come down. Uh, this the gameplay you're seeing here is me using the cannon um, and you'd use it uh, I would use it with the glider for high volley power which was pretty cool so that that kind of fit into it really nicely the next part of the Karakur system made it even more exciting is the fusion Karakuri so not only do you have these building blocks I think there were six in the game total 
uh, and you could have uh, four equipped, you could then combine them. So if you stood still and you placed the Karakuri out, based on a combination of them put next to each other, they would combine into bigger Karakuri, which were the uh, fusion Karakuri. So on the on screen, you can see that barricade, that big wooden wall. If you took six of the boxes that you could plant and jump off of and put them in a grid, almost like creating a, almost like creating a, a nether portal in Minecraft, if they all sp were next to each other and attached, they would automatically turn into a barricade. You could create harpoons, you could create traps, you could create uh, healing bonuses, you could create uh, magical resistance. So like it had this old building system where you could create opportunities for yourself using the fusion curry, which was super fun. Uh, it did have its bugs. Uh, sometimes it would kind of not line up properly or uh, not work exactly as you expected to, or you know there were some issues with it. But in general, when it worked, and it worked most of the time, super fun. Uh, you know, you could, and it allowed you to play your way regardless of your weapon. So if you're playing ranged, you can stand on the barricade or you can create yourself a, a watchtower and get on top of it. The uh, traps were great for setting up opportunities for the slower weapons. You could also create opportunities with buffs or damage reduction or all kinds of really cool, fun, crazy things. Uh, you could also interrupt. There were really nice counters, like you create fireworks that go up and knock the monsters out of the sky. Uh, you can, you know, <laughs> create some really cool stuff. And it, it replaces traps and craftables uh, in like other hunting genre games where you'd bring something that would do the same thing. You would then have this extra system, which felt pretty good, where you could use it to uh, uh, whatever way you want. It was pretty flexible. And I think that combined with the weapon system made the experience overall super thrilling. It was very fun to explore all the Karakuri and Fusion Karakuri options uh, and put those all together. There were some uh, unique mechanics uh, as well. So uh, we'll see maybe if it's in this in this video here, but uh, you could also break off parts of the monster and then expose a, uh, a glowing, uh, almost like this life essence. See on the hind leg of this wolf? You can actually jump on top of it, mount the monster, and then pull essence out of that. Not only would that give you uh, a recovery for some of your healing, but you could also use it to get thread to create Markara Curry, which means that you... As you damage the monster, you can get more thread to create more Karakuri and do some really cool stuff. So uh, that part was cool. The mounting feature in general was kind of iffy. It, <laughs> it, you, you really had to work with it and learn how it functioned because it, it was a little buggy, but it's super fun. There were times where monsters would run, they would flee to a new area, and I would just jump and hitch a ride on them. You can grab on top of them, which is pretty cool. You can also get on top of them uh, when they're doing like ground AOEs, grab on their leg and climb them. So you have almost this dragon's dogma climbing mechanic. It was pretty wonky. Uh, I think if it was a little better implemented, it would be um, you know, a lot more integral to the gameplay, but it did mean that you could use this grab and pull essence out feature, which was nice and it was actually pretty cool uh, to have that function the way that it did. And next, let's talk about the dragon Karakuri. So the way they did their environments in Wild Hearts, super fun, a lot of fun uh, to like, farm up and, and build. You had these pits all over the map and you would you, you can go around and level them up and get resources. Uh, and then they will allow you to build however you want. You could choose uh, you can choose whatever you want to deploy in the world. You can actually choose your spawn locations and you can choose your fast warp locations, but there were parts that would take more resources to do it versus less. So in general, you would kind of like focus on getting them where you could. But if you wanted to camp in a certain spot, you could. You could also spawn zip lines, which means that you could create your own ways to traverse the environment. Uh, you can set them up uh, as a way to damage monsters as well. Um, it's not just the, the in-combat Karakuri, but like a, almost like a building system. On top of that, one of my favorite parts about the game is as you progressed further, you unlocked more and more of the Dragon Karakuri, which is the non-combat building, and you could actually get a uh, like resource farming. So you would create farms that would generate ore or they would generate uh, environmental resources that you need. So rather than constantly having to go to the maps and do expeditions or uh, you know free hunts where you just go to the environment and you just run around and you mine and you pick flowers and do all that, you could actually just create a farm of yours uh, in your like the starting camp or near a camp that you wanted and you could use that to get all the resources you need. And by the end, the end of the game, you no longer have to run around mining and doing all that because you've created your own sense of generating income for those resources yourself, which is a 
it, it, it's nice. It was really cool. It, it took a while to get going and you had to invest in it. But once you had it, it was super nice to have. Uh, it meant that farming was uh, more about killing monsters and less about running around the environment grabbing stuff, which is pretty cool. I think that's a nice addition to the game. Let's talk about the gearing system. The gearing system is pretty cool. Starting with the armor system. My only gripe with the armor system is that there wasn't really as much armor as I would have liked in the game, but the, the system for it was pretty unique. So you see in the bottom middle, there's this, uh, this slider that goes across those five icons. You have your baseline gear, which is the early game gear. I won't show you the end game gear, but this is the early game gear, and you can see that on these, you have uh, traits, just like you would normally in a hunting genre game that give you benefits, and you kind of craft the gear and equip it and get that bonus. But as you go later into the game, you start getting these traits that have that icon uh, underneath them, on, on the trait there on the right, you can see that down on the bottom, and that sets up your, whether you're human or kimono leaning, which basically are you, you know, positive or negative on that. And when you go to the top tab here, you can actually upgrade or evolve the gear that you get. You craft the default set piece, and then you can evolve it to be either human or kimono. You see how like each version is kind of the same base items. Look at the helmet here. Uh, we can see something a little bit bigger. So this is the chest piece. This is more human and this is more monster. And so when you do that, you get uh, extra bonuses. It changes the stats. It's a way to evolve the gear and make it even stronger. But it also unlocks unique traits that you can only get access to if you are leaning more human or leaning more monster. And so it gives you an, another added layer to just having equipment. It's nice to kind of upgrade it. It does require resources to evolve it to be more evil versus good. And having those traits locked in meant that you kind of had to commit to a build, which I think was pretty cool. It's a nice little addition to that. The next thing to talk about is the, uh, the weapon system. This one is a little bit more uh, exciting. It's, I think there's some really cool stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to scroll down here because I think it'll show, it's a minor spoiler. It shows what monsters are beyond the early game. But this is the, the weapon skill tree that you'll see. So uh, the, the, what's cool about this is, firstly, it's, it's, it, is, it functions just like you'd expect from a hunting genre. You are creating unique weapons. So if you look at the icon for the weapon, that is actually a unique, each one of these is a unique weapon. So you are crafting it based on the monster you kill and the traits that you get on it. So you are still doing that process. However, there is a unique aspect in this in that there are inherited skills. So it's not just what weapon you end up with, it matters what path you take to get to that weapon, which is awesome. It ended up being really fun and unique to kind of make your own path. So every time you upgrade a weapon, so if we upgrade this here to make this sword, and then we go over to this, it'll ask if I want to inherit skills. So I can inherit a skill that I had from the previous weapon that I just made, and now that skill shows up on the next one. So you can actually end up making your own unique weapon with the, the traits that you want. And you can go up and down the tree too. So if you go down this way and you go down here, you can go up again and then back down and then over and then down. Uh, so if you end up farming a whole bunch, you can create very unique weapons with a, 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 your, your preferred combination of stats and, and uh, traits on them. And it end up be creating this really fun system where you were like, oh, I kind of want to see if I can get this weapon with that trait on it, but I have to take this weird pass. I'm going to farm a little bit more to get that weapon. That system ended up being really cool. I think that's unique and fun. Uh, and it, <laughs> it adds a nice layer to just, uh, to not just, hey, I want to get, hey, this, you know, the red plum Nodachi 2 is the best Nodachi, so I'm going to get that. It's more like, okay, so you got the red plum Nodachi 2, but what traits did you put on it? And how did you customize it in order to make it the weapon that you want? And you can also, because it's so flexible, it meant that you can make, there's plenty of builds out there for uh, Wild Hearts weapons that end up including various different types of builds. It's the same weapon, but different builds. And you can even, because of this system, you can make weapons that normally wouldn't be as meta or as good. You could find ways to put new traits on them that would make them viable. And it makes the, the whole weapon crafting system a lot more in depth and a lot more exciting. So that is that aspect. There's also a uh, charms slash talisman system in the game. And this one uh, honestly left a lot to be desired. I actually didn't really like the talisman system very much. Not only did I not like the talisman system just as an equip, the way this works is you get talismans various ways throughout the game by unlocking secrets or completing missions or beating, uh, you know, specific kimono. 
they just drop. You just get a whole bunch of them. It's kind of just random which ones you get and what, what traits they have on them. And you just equip five of them, and that's it. Uh, there's no vendor you can go to to craft these to get extra bonuses on them. Uh, there's no way to combine them or, or I integrate them. It's just like, hey, you pick five, you get stats. How good they are is you know, contingent on which ones you got to drop and whatnot. You can have a certain number of types, but there wasn't really a whole lot going on with the Talisman system. So this was probably, as far as the gearing system goes, the worst part to me. I felt like it just didn't, I mean, it was just, you're not going to say no to extra traits, right? You're not going to say no to getting extra power or extra health or extra defense. Uh, it does have uh, various bonuses to it, but it just wasn't really, considering how unique and fun the weapons and armor system was, the talisman system just felt like it was a little, uh, a little tacked on, but you know, it does give you more ways to customize your build, uh, which is pretty cool. So at least that, that exists the way that it does. Next, let's talk about the monsters themselves, the kimonos, and the actual encounters. I, I think there was a good mix of interesting and uh, kind of mad. I, there was some, some of the, the kimonos just felt a little repetitive uh, in general, but there were some, was that were some of them that were super fun and interesting. I, in general, they were pretty aggressive and pretty spammy, which I think is okay for a game where you can create your own your own Karakuri and Fusion Karakuri. So if the Karakuri system didn't exist, I feel like the monsters would be a little bit too aggressive without much downtime for what they actually needed to be. But because of the Fusion Karakuri and the Karakuri, you're able to counteract that with your own motions and, and uh, reactions. You set up you know, chain traps, you can create uh, some defenses, you can heal up after. And it lend itself to some really fun multiplayer gameplay as well, which I think was really cool. Uh, so I think early on, it starts you off pretty soft. Uh, some of the, the early kimonos aren't really all that challenging if you've played any hunting genre game before. And then it starts getting more challenging towards the end where you really have to understand your weapon and you really have to use Karakuri. Some of the later end game, uh, especially like the super end game kimono, you have to use your, your Karakuri or you won't be able to be effective against them, which I think is really fun and kind of built into the core game. So I think overall, the encounters were good. Uh, some of them were a, a little bit less challenging, but there was a good variety of them that kept it interesting. You know, like the big boar that was super sized, some of the smaller monsters, uh, different uh, mixtures of it. I think the art style was unique. I actually didn't like the art style at first. It's just essentially, uh, natural elements mixed with uh, wild animals. So it's usually a rat plus uh, some bark or a, a boar plus some, you know, tree vines or some kind of combination of that. And that's kind of the whole story of the game. So you're actually using that uh, that there and that's kind of the, the extra piece to it. So I think in general, the encounters were good uh, and, it, and it really had a nice progression of starting out relatively easy and straightforward and then progressing upwards towards really challenging, aggressive monsters that became manageable when you were using all the systems in the game properly. And on that same note, let's talk about multiplayer, just the co-op experience. Uh, I think the Karakuri system led itself pretty well to that. There were times where if you're trying to create a fusion Karakuri and a teammate is standing nearby, they'll end up getting on top of your stuff or they can build while you're building, which can ruin the fusion you're trying to create, which could be quite frustrating. Uh, but in general, I think it was, it was pretty cool. They also had a downed system where you could go and you can res them and then you can kind of go back into the fight. And obviously the support Karakuri that uh, kind of took place as group consumables ended up being really nice because if you had one person that was locking down the kimono and you had one person who was doing uh, elemental resistances or putting out healing lanterns, super nice. And that kind of, that, that interaction between each other could be uh, really rewarding for, for co-op. And I think uh, the building system also just made it really nice. It, it is kind of cool too, again, with how aggressive the kimono are in this game. Uh, solo play felt a little less uh, rewarding than multiplayer gameplay. And usually I like these games solo for the challenge of it, but it was uh, very satisfying to be in a multiplayer setup. Let's talk about some of the negatives. I think there's uh, definitely some big, big concerns that uh, came with the launch of the game. So I will be honest, for a $70 title, I think it was pretty much unacceptable the, the state the game was in when it launched. It overall was more or less complete, but it felt like they launched it 
maybe without like it needed another two months of QA and polish. Massive performance issues on all platforms, primarily PC, which happens a lot if it's if a game is meant and designed for console and gets ported to PC, there's always going to be performance issues because on console you have a fixed set of hardware. Like if you're set, cur setting for current gen consoles, for example, PS5, Xbox S, or X, you have a fixed set of hardware and a fixed set of software. So you can optimize for that so it runs well on those. But when you open it up to PC, where anyone can have any combination of hardware and software that, uh, that works on the game, you have all these weird interactions that need to be polished out and function. On top of that, there were plenty of bugs. There were issues where you would lose sound completely. Uh, in mid-combat and then you'd have to restart your game. I had to restart my game constantly, uh, maybe several times a day while playing in order to just keep it functioning properly. Uh, you had plenty of issues where you couldn't connect to other players or you would get booted out or items would get stuck in places or you would get stuck on a fusion curry. It, it just wasn't in a great state. So if you're looking for whether or not to get Wild Hearts, I would wait until you get the all clear that the issues have been patched out they are patching. It's been about a week since the game came out, which is super cool. Um, and they have patched it once and they're looking for more patches. So that's good. Uh, as long as they make good on that promise to get the game into a solid state before, uh, before they move on to other things, or maybe they decide to do DLC or a sequel, then uh, that would be good. But if they kind of left in the state it's in, it would be pretty sad. And it's also pretty sad because the game itself is actually really good. It's very well made. The game itself is super fun. It was just poorly delivered and uh, a poorly launched, I would say. And it's something that took away from the launch for a lot of people. And it probably hurt them a lot in uh, people that will probably never try the game now because it had such a bad launch. And then if you look at on online reviews were pretty poor just because of the performance and the polish. It wasn't really most of the negative reviews. Almost none of the negative reviews were about the game itself. It was more just about the, the delivery of it, which is unfortunate. Sometimes you have cutoff dates where you just have to ship or you didn't plan properly or you just couldn't solve a core problem. But uh, for a game this good, especially at a $70 price point on PC, you would expect a lot better polish and stability on a launch, uh, especially if it's a paid title and not a game as a service that uh, will have regular updates. It's, it's pretty sad to see that. So that's the downside, Pl a little buggy. Uh, Performance is pretty bad, but it uh, hopefully will continue to get better uh, as, as time goes on. And if that's the case, it could be definitely one of the better games of the year if they can get it functioning just right. So there's that. That's a shame. That's a bummer, but it's the truth. And lastly, the story. Uh, the story was actually more or less, it was fine. It wasn't really anything that really is it, not like super memorable. I think the art style is the most memorable aspect of it. The mixture of beast and uh, you know fauna and flora combining together into these crazy forces of nature, I think uh, ended up being a, a super memorable visual aesthetic that I will remember for a long time. It's just super cool to see how they put everything together, plants and seeds and vines and sap and ice and fire and lava and rocks and earth all mixed together with wild animals like rats and tigers and birds and crows and all this stuff. It just ended up creating a really cool vibe that I started getting into a lot towards the end. The story itself, without any spoilers, uh, was rather generic. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean generic stories are bad. It just kind of felt like it was uh, rather generic and it was kind of just like hunting and surviving and doing all that. The one thing I did appreciate is the game is uh, pretty serious in that it's kind of like, I think one of the things that can be fun for some people in Monster Hunter is how cutesy and uh, goofy Monster Hunter can be, especially with Palicos and all the, the goofiness on top of it. Sometimes it feels like it's, you, you know, the the, story, the world of Monster Hunter is dire and scary and terrifying. It's like Lionel Johnson's world for the Dark Angels in Warhammer where there's beasts the size of buildings killing people and then they're just, they're having like cat cafe experiences. So there's like that, and there's none of that in this game. This game is very much uh, in the vibe of, you know, you get to uh, focus on the environment, the world, and how the world is changing, and the hunts itself. But the story is not anything to, to truly write home about, in my opinion. And that's my review of, uh, of Wild Hearts. I think that it could have had a better launch. It definitely could have done with more gear options when it comes to armor. 
it definitely could have had more uh, end game content uh, than just kind of the, the options that were there once you're done with the story. So I think it's one of the best problems to have when you are talking about uh, a game is, is that there wasn't enough. There's more, you needed more. You needed more options. You needed more content. You needed more monsters to fight. You need more gear to craft. All of that, I think, is the best part of the game. But that's my review of Wild Hearts. I think if they patch it up, it's worth picking up. The game is awesome. And it has a lot of unique gameplay mechanics that you don't find everywhere. And it's uh, a fun, fresh experience in the hunting genre or in the action RPG genre that you might be looking for. So if you found value in this video, leave a like down below. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, if you have any questions or comments for me, you'll find me live every day on twitch.tv forward slash drybear. Be there or be a lemon starburst. If you enjoyed yourself today, leave a like down below. You can support me and my work on Patreon and view Patreon exclusive content, link in the description. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.